Chihei Mauri Ora Te Urunga Tū Te Urunga Tapu Te Mauri Tū Te Mauri Tapu Te Mauri Te Whiwhia Te Mauri Te Rawea Te Mauri Nō Hea Te Mauri Nō Runga Nō Rangi Nō Nuku Tū Te Nei Te Mauri Ka Whakapiki Te Nei Te Mauri Ka Whakakaki Te Mauri Nō Nā Tipua Te Mauri Nō Nā Atua Te Mauri Nā Rangi Whakaputa Ki Te Whai Ao Ki Te Ao Marama Uhi Wero Tau mai te mauri hau mie, hui e, tai ki e. Kai ngā mana, kai ngā reo, kai ngā mātā waka, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou me ngā mate, kai runga iā koutou. Kua hui hui mai nei ki tēnei hui hui nga. Nau mai... Ki te wānanga aro nui o tāmaki makaurau Koutou Te aumāngea Kai a koutou e pupuri ana Te mauri o te mātauranga Ko tāu, ko tā tātau He rui rui I ngā kākano o te mātauranga E ki ana o mātau tīpuna Ko te manu Kākai i te miro nōna te ngahere Ko te tangata kākai i te mātauranga nōna te ao. Nō reira, kia koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. E ha i te mea nōna ia nei te aroha nōna tūpuna Tuku iho, tuku iho E hara i te mea no naga nei Te aroha no ngā Tuku na tuku iho Tuku iho Can we have that one more time with some love? E hara i te mea No naia nei te aroha No ngā tūpuna Tuku iho Tuku iho E hara i te mea no naia nei Te aroha no ngā Tūpuna tūku iho I tūku iho Nō reira, huri noi tō tātou whare Ngā rangatira Ngā waiwai tapu, ngā manuhiri tuārangi, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, cocktails are now served at the end. Thank you so much for the Seafledge Choir um, <laughs> who welcomed us to Maharahui this year. And I'd like to welcome Katrina Bassett, um, our General Manager from Catalyst here in Auckland, to the stage to do the um, formal welcome to the Hui. Tēnā koutou. Nau mai, haere mai, ki tamaki makaurau, ki te hui o mahara. Nā mihi nū ki nā manuhiri o tawahi, nā mihi hoki nā manuhiri o nā hauewha. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Welcome everybody to the third New Zealand mahara hui. A big, big welcome to overseas visitors. Thank you for travelling from as far away as Switzerland to be with us here today. And also thank you to all of you from coming, for coming from all the different parts of New Zealand. So Mahara is now over 10 years old and in a technology landscape that changes so quickly that's actually getting to be positively middle-aged. 
um, while Mahara has grown up around it, the way that we interact with technology has been completely transformed. Uh, the very first Mahara commit was in the, at the end of 2006, and in that year, MySpace was the most popular website in the US. Facebook opened its platform to the world for the first time. Twitter was launched. There were no Android dev devices on the market. And Google Chrome, which is now the most popular browser in the world, didn't even exist. Um, 2006 was also the year that poor Pluto also lost its planet status. Although I hear it might be getting it back, so very exciting. So over the next two days, we're going to be given the opportunity to see 21 presentations and two keynotes. We've got speakers from all over New Zealand, from Australia and from Fiji. Presenters who are lecturers, learning technologists and long-time e-portfolio proponents will look at a wide range of topics and themes. They're going to provide insight into how portfolios can be used for students, discuss the challenges and affordances of portfolio work for lecturers, share their tips for implementing portfolios at the institution level, look at lifelong and life-wide portfolio work and touch on creating portfolios collaboratively. So events like this don't happen um, out of nowhere, so I'd like to thank a few people. Firstly, to the organisers for a massive effort getting this, this whole event put together. So that's Lisa and Shen from AUT and Christina from Catalyst. Um, also, I'd like to really thank AUT for this absolutely wonderful venue. It's the second time that AUT has hosted Naharahui. And finally, the sponsors, AUT, Catalyst and Ako Aotearoa. So, Enjoy the hui. I'm sure you're going to have a fantastic two days. Thank you. We're just increasing the volume slightly so that also people in the back can hear things. Thank you very much, Katrina. And uh, most of you will know me because you got all the emails from me and Christina. And I'm really, really happy to be able to welcome you also to the Hui. And we are just going through some housekeeping things. And as Katrina already mentioned, we are here at AUT um, University, uh, which is the host. And um, our sponsors are AOT as well, and it's been really fantastic working together with Shen and Lisa from the Center for Learning and Teaching team, again, to organize this way for you to, and to welcome you here to Auckland. Despite the bad weather we've had, I think we've kind of jumped that hurdle and are now getting into the sunshine for the next two days. And then we also sponsors, and Aqua Aotearoa, again, is a sponsor, and we are very grateful for that sponsorship. If you'd like to tweet and do all the social media things, please use Maharahui17 um, and um, then we can collate tweets and photos that you have taken during the Hui. Some other housekeeping things. In case of an evacuation, please follow Shen or Lisa. First look, of course, where the exit signs are and go through those doors, but we, will us uh, we usually congregate, or we should congregate, we haven't had to do that yet, um, <laughs> just to the right on the outside where you came in. And um, there shouldn't really be any earthquakes, so duck cover and hold on will hopefully not apply here in Auckland. Volcanoes. Volcanoes, but I think we have fair warning before those <laughs> need to go up. Um, toilets are just some out there, or if you head down the stairs a little bit further to where the comfy couches are, then you find um, toilets there as well. Um, if you have dietary, uh, if you let us know that you had dietary requirements, there will be a special table um, for you there, so we cater to all of them. But you are also very welcome to partake of the regular things because a lot of the choices that we pick for the hui also include vegetarian and in some cases also vegan or gluten free or dairy free. So also have a look around there. Um, events will have everything labeled so that you can be assured um, that everybody is covered. And if you have any questions please approach um, Lisa or Shen. Can you please put up your hands? So Lisa is all the way in the front and Shen and we are wearing uh, the red lanyards. Um, our AV team, um, Reza and Brian are also wearing the red ones so if you want to know where anything is at AUT, anyone in red can help you. Um, presenters have white lanyards. Our keynote speakers Mark and Shane um, have black lanyards and regular attendees have blue ones so you can easily identifiable. 
if you want to do all the social media thing with hashtag Mahrahui17 uh, or if you do need to check emails in between then you can use the Wi-Fi that is available information on that is in your um, on your venue schedule in the welcome pack it is the Wi-Fi network Mahrahui17 with the password Mahara2017 um, or if you are from a university that does have at your room then you can use your at your room details if you are a presenter, so anybody with a light lanyard and you have not yet given us your presentation or you would like to use your own laptop, please see us as soon as possible during a break so that we can make sure that everything actually works up front um, rather than taking the time um, in between sessions to set you up. It would also be very nice if you put your mobiles on silent or at least on vib uh, vibration so that um, you're not distracted when you're talking, suddenly your telephone goes off and you lose your train of thought. Um, but of course, um, you're well, very welcome to use any of your mobile devices or laptops during the HUI. We also have some tables in the back if you'd like to type more easily. And we also have um, multi plugs on the sides on the tables so that you can charge um, your devices. There are also some multi plugs um, around the room, um, so please feel free to use any of those. Um, and then tonight, after the last session, um, with a short break in between, we will be gathering at the box at our TS Center, so just down the hill, Wakefield Street, across Queen Street, and then there's a big sign already, our TS Center should be lit up by 6 o'clock because it's quite dark. Um, and there we'll have drinks, and you're welcome to join. Um, every pack includes a drink voucher. Um, so you just have to make sure that I'm getting there to the venue first so that I can set up the tab for everyone. Um, so you're very welcome to use that voucher for a drink and then um, network with everybody at the Hui. As you will have seen from the um, conference program, today we are primarily in this room. Um, but we do have three sessions in the room um, adjacent. The schedule changed slightly, um, so we will actually have uh, playing Mahara switched to later in the afternoon. That is Massimo and Shen's presentation. And um, Shen will give her second presentation together with Lisa first. So bridging the gaps will now be at um, 1.55 and playing Mahara at 3.30. The guidebook app that we have set up um, is already updated. Just the print schedule hasn't been updated because that was a last minute change. And if you do want to kind of talk to people, not go to presentations, do more hallway track conferencing, then you're very welcome to use the room next door. Um, there is also a computer available, there's a projector, so if you kind of want to have an impromptu session or show some people something, then you're very welcome to use that. Or outside here are also comfy couches or down where the other toilets are there other comfy couches as well um, because this is a really nice building having very different learning spaces and making it possible for students also to meet in informal settings then you're very welcome to use any of those areas and also explore the building and see if you might get inspired of doing some of those things in your own institutions. So I just mentioned the guidebook app. Um, there is a link to it also on the website. Um, if you want to use it, you can simply download the app to your um, iOS devices or Android devices and then simply search for Mahara and the app will, um, and the guide will come up. Um, that application allows you also to tweet from it, to take photos and to take notes as well if you don't want to have paper. But if you do want to write with paper, we have heaps of pens and uh, paper pads outside, so please feel free to grab any of those so that you're not losing any good ideas or insight or things you want to follow up. Already mentioned the drinks. Can't mention them often enough, so we don't really look forward to seeing you there. Because also Mark, our keynote speaker um, for today, ensured me that he will certainly be there because he does enjoy a good bottle of wine. So if you want any suggestions, <laughs> any suggestions on drinks, please feel free to see Mark. Um, but right now, I would like to really, really uh, extend a warm welcome to him um, today. 
Mark didn't have to travel very far, just from 56 Wakefield um, down here to the conference center because he's the acting director of the Center for Learning and Teaching. He took over from Stanley Freelich, who is now heading up Aqua Aotearoa. And um, Mark, as one of the very, 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 very first people who has ever worked with Mahara because he's been involved from the beginning of the project. So from the conceptualization phase in 2005 through the initial year of testing and um, getting the software up and running in 2006 and 2007. And he's been using it since here at AUT. With his team, it has been supported um, by the c -flat team has been used in many different faculties and we hear a number of um, AUT faculty speak here at the conference. And so it's a really great pleasure for me to hear him what he has to say. Um, the title of the presentation changed slightly, so I'm not going to even attempt a short summary of it or hint at what he might be talking about, but I uh, would just like to welcome Mark up front and we'll certainly have also time for discussions after his presentation so that we can interact with him. Thank you so much. Interestingly, I'm well, Moreno Koto. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. It's actually it's an interesting place for me to be in the sense the, the acting director role is something that I was kind of thrown into um, almost a year ago now, it was probably May last year where I was asking if I would stand in and I said, yes but I don't actually want the job, I'll do it, I'll act it and I'm, actually, I'm still acting. So um, it's been an ongoing performance. Um, the second point that I guess I've been thinking about is that this is actually the first address that I've um, done that would be considered a keynote. Obviously presented a number of times in a number of workshops and it's amazing how much more stressful it is thinking about a keynote and thinking about a message that you want to give across and especially thinking about these people are expected to listen to me for an hour um, so we will probably um, try and keep it contained and we'll try and keep it reasonably um, to the point. I've also put my Twitter um, name there. So if, if you feel like you'd like to send um, a message to me during the presentation, I mean by all means put your hand up and inter interject and interrupt. Um, but if you would like to send a message via Twitter, I'll probably get it on my little smartphone here, on my watch, um, and that will alert me to something's happened and it might well be something completely different, um, just that I've got my number of steps up or it might be a Twitter message which I can attempt to answer. So Katrina has successfully probably robbed my first half dozen slides, but I'll plough on anyway. Um, because what, as Christina said, um, I, I have actually been involved in the project right from the very early steering group that uh, assisted Mark Nichols at, when he was at Massey University in the original project that, um, that imagined and redefined the idea of an e-portfolio. So we started off um, and and so I am looking at the idea of where Mahara has grown, but actually what I'm looking at more is um, how our educational technology has evolved around that. Um, so really what I'm going to be looking at is some of these aspects. So technology has changed in that time, obviously. We've grown a lot, we've evolved a lot over those 10 years. Social interaction through technology has also changed uh, hugely and, and we are now we experience social interactions and our students, our children and our students experience social interactions in ways that we never even imagined. Probably only four or five years ago we wouldn't have imagined let alone ten years ago. And then I think about the way that our, the technology we use in education has changed and I've put a couple of question marks there because I wonder whether we have kept up so the changing nature of our technology and then a lot more question marks about whether our teaching has changed for the 20th, 21st century and the use of technology. So the challenge that I would make is to think about Mahara as a tool, one of the tools, only one of the tools, 
that will assist us in becoming more in tune with the way that our social technological society is moving. And so as Katrina said, we are now 10 as, um, as a product. Um, Mahara is probably probably more like actually 11 or 12, I suspect. But I think it would have been, was it 2006 that we would have originally done our case study yeah. at AUT? 2006? Yeah. yeah. So part of, part of the original um, development of the product was that I think three institutions around New Zealand implemented Mahara as a case study for a very early pilot. And that's what we did in our School of Education. It actually was a bit rubbish, if I can say so. It was, I, I seem to recall it was version 0 0.7. Now, nobody would even use version 1 of something. We were using pre-version 1. Um, and that's kind of part of the historical place of Mahara at AUT because at the end of 2006, the lecturers using Mahara at School of Education kind of said, well, we quite like the idea, but it doesn't work. And how can we make it work? And I said, well, it's evolving, and no, that wasn't good enough, and it, this, that, and the other. I said, the only thing we can do really is bring it in-house and have it hosted here at AUT rather than having it hosted in Wellington. And so we did that, and I believe, coincidentally, it was because of the evolution of the product that actually made it work. But the next year, 2006, it did work better. Sorry, 2007, it did work better. And we've really just stuck historically with our own in-house hosted version of Mahara ever since. So I do admit quite openly that, and no disrespect to Mahara, we don't use Mahara because we have evaluated it as being the best product on the market. We use it historically because we used it right from day one and it's continued to work for us. So there's really been no need for us to go out and do a full evaluation across the whole market. Coincidentally, actually, I was at a, um, dare I even use the word, I was at a pebble, pebble pad symposium where Lisa and I were yesterday morning. And it, you know, it's really interesting to see how e-portfolio products have matured and come to market 10 years on. So this is basically the only screenshot I have of what Mahara looked like in 2007. Um, I don't know if Catalyst have more sort of documented library of screenshots and the functionality from back then. I can't even be sure that was version 0 0.7. Um, but you can see that the interface and the layout has changed quite significantly since those days. So I was going to then start to talk about, and this is where you robbed my slide, thank you very much. <laughs> what have we done since then? Right? Think about 10 years ago. So we've had certain products that have come to market and have grown or not. So just a few figures. Now these are figures I've just kind of plucked off various websites. I've, I've made no claim that these are accurate or up to date, they're really just indicative of growth. Okay? So Facebook I think was created around 2003, it reached a billion users by 2012. Um, at the moment they estimate that a billion users currently are mobile users and of those, um, sorry of the current users, roughly 48% of users log on each day. So we're talking about, you know, in the region of a half a, half a billion users daily that use Facebook globally. Again, totally inaccurate figures probably, but it's just indicative. Of course, the other thing that we are now wedded to and use hugely is YouTube. YouTube created in 2005. Um, there's an estimated 1.3 billion users of YouTube. I put this figure down and then just a couple of days ago I went back to where I got it and thought that can't, surely that can't be right. And according to this website statisticbrain.com, yes it is right, that YouTube serves out roughly 5 billion videos a day. And if you think about how many, a certain number of billion hours of video are watched per month. I can't remember the exact figure, but five billion videos a day. I mean, just think of the extraordinary processing power and storage that that takes. Twitter is the other one that, when I first saw it, and I, you know, I first used Twitter probably not long after it emerged, and probably like many users at that time thought, 
140 characters, are you kidding me? What, what's the point in that? What can you do with that? Um, and I still wonder whenever I see what a certain person in the US uses Twitter for, I still think, <laughs> what is the point of that? You know, it really ought to be banned. Um, created in 2006, 340 million active users, averaging 58 million tweets a day. Now compared to the billion, five, sorry, five billion YouTube videos, it's probably very small. Um, but Twitter's the kind of thing that just surges and drifts with, with big events. I haven't even looked for, but I'm sure if you look for the number of tweets per minute per second during an American election, for example, or during the Super Bowl, Bowl final or whatever, it would be you know, hundreds of millions of tweets per minute, per hour, whatever it would be. So really just an indication of the kind of scale of growth of some of those tools. Now, not only the software tools, but I found this figure, and again, the next couple of slides are very rough indicators and somewhat out of date, but they, they help to give my message. So this graph I found off uh, another website, and it was a prediction in 2013, is that the date there, yeah, March 2013, a prediction of the way that hardware sales would change. And the important thing to see there is, and I've just, the, the note I've got here too is, to, is just to um, comment that the iPhone, the Apple iPhone, which I think was really the first transitional device that brought the interactive glass screen to prominence, um, that was introduced in the early 2007. So by 2013, their sales has already exceeded one billion devices a year. So growing from um, a device in 2007, in six years, that was now over a billion units a year. But the important issue here, I think, is if you have a look at these, these column charts, the bottom orangey colour is desktop PCs. The middle, I think that's supposed to be green, although I'm not sure if it's showing up well on the screen. That's laptops, and then we've got smartphones, and then we've got tablets. Now, this was a prediction back in 2013. I suspect very much that the top dark blue area will be bigger than that. The tablets have kind of taken off more than expected. But the point really here is that the growth in the market, in the hardware market, is in mobile devices. So the prediction in 2013, and remember, I haven't got figures to show the actual result, but I suspect they follow the same trend. Um, the, certainly the trend is that mobile devices are what have grown. <coughs> the other point that I think is worth noting is that it's not just the growth of devices, because again, this was a prediction back in 2012, and how that's come to play, I suspect, is along the same lines. The growth was that new users would tail off because these devices would reach a kind of saturation point, but that the replacement and the updating of devices where people want to keep updated with the latest version would continue to grow. So the number of devices being sold each year would actually grow, although the number of new users would start to tail off. So I guess the point there is that we don't just buy one device. We are now so wedded, well, I guess I'm talking personally, because I almost lost my phone recently and I felt like my life was over. <laughs> um, we are now so wedded to our devices that we, you know, we constantly are trying to make sure we've got one of the later versions at least. <coughs> so that we're saying that um, predictions show that a maturing and saturated market is boosted by the tendency for customers to buy the latest. But it's not all growth. And again, Katrina mentioned MySpace, and um, I don't know, many of you are probably even too young to remember MySpace. It was created in, I think, about 2003, um, but to the notes I've got say that between 2005 and 2009, it was the largest social networking site in the world. In 2005, it was sold to News Corporation for, five, for over half a billion dollars. Now, I actually had a, a, a recollection that that figure was closer to a billion dollars, but you know the, the actual number doesn't matter because in 2011 it was sold to Justin Timberlake for 35 million dollars. So over that intervening six years, the product just completely lost traction, completely lost market share, lost you know over half a billion dollars in value, 
and it just essentially died. The other, I guess, cautionary tale is Research in Motion, BlackBerry. So it, BlackBerry was the, the hardware device of choice in the sort of late 2000s. Um, and it still is actually a really important device because it has extra encryption and security levels and so on that your standard iPhone and Samsung device and Android device don't have. That's my understanding. But you can see that around, um, when is that, around 2012 or so, it just missed the bus. And BlackBerry users and BlackBerry sales just kind of dropped away and became almost non-existent. Now my point as I go through this address is that we as institutions are at risk of missing the bus if we don't read the signs. So the, I guess my, my initial point here is that technologies and, and social tools um, meet a need, they catch an imagination and they either boom or they bust. Now I'm not suggesting that our universities will or our institutions will bust, but we are at risk of not reading the signs and not reading the signs of change. I actually had a, a comment recently by somebody from this university, I believe, who said something along the lines of, but well, universities have been like this for the last 500 years, they'll be the same for the next 500 years. And I just thought, oh my God, you know, that is such a dangerous point of view to take. <coughs> So the transition um, following an introduction of a technology, I think, matches, we're all familiar with the Rogers diffusion of innovation curve. Um, so what we're saying is that um, an uptake of a technology tends to have, at the, the early stages, we tend to have the, the, the early adopters, the real technophiles who will take up some, some device or some technology quickly. And then we have the kind of early and middle majority. The, the um, bulk of people will be delayed in the way they take something up. And then we'll have the laggards, and the, those are the terms that Rogers uses. So a technology uptake, I think, is then followed by a pedagogy uptake. So in our, in our institutions, the first, and you know, I'm speaking very generalised here, of course, the first uses of a technology don't necessarily apply that technology effectively to the way that they are teaching and the way that students engage. And of course, the timeline I put down the bottom there is incredibly in, imprecise. You know, are we talking years? Are we talking decades? It depends on the technology. It depends on a whole raft of things. So it's the concept here I'm trying to present. And then thirdly, I believe the way that students are assessed is further lagged behind the way technology is applied in teaching. So my belief, I guess, and my theory, my philosophy, is that the most useful part of evolution of technology or evolution of, of um, pedagogy is the assessment strategy that surrounds it. If you're still assessing students in an outdated um, strategy, then an updated pedagogy is pointless. So I do believe that we have to try and align those. I do believe that we have to try and keep those as closely matched as we can so that the use, for example, of an e-portfolio activity with students will really only be effective if the way that activity is assessed, if ultimately is, if if it is an assessment activity, that the assessment is properly aligned with the e-portfolio activity. And just on the use, I found this image as I was looking for things when I was preparing. I thought the old, the whole, you know, the old um, aspect of a bell curve. I mean, I'm old enough as a teacher that I do remember trying to fit students to a bell curve, you know, 50% will pass and 50% will fail. So the bell curve, I think, you know, it actually, when you un unwrap it, if it's used in that way, is more like a monster um, than it is anything useful. So I don't think I'm trying to um, recommend a bell curve. So enough about old and, and changing technologies. I was thinking as I was coming in, this morning that actually it's, it's amazing to think back on the, um, 
the, the, the rate of change because it, it is actually only 30 years ago that I was teaching in, a, in an area school in the South Island in a small town that still had the old manual telephone exchange where you um, wound the handle, the exchange said what number do you want and everybody was on party lines and it's only 30 years ago, you know, and now we can do video calls with our grandchildren on the other side of the world as we we're walking along the road on our, on our, our smartphone. I mean the, the benefit of the old mobile exchange actually was um, I, I realised that when you rang to speak to somebody and the, the opera, operator said oh, no they've gone down the road for dinner with somebody else would you like me to put you through to them there and yes of course and you know like everybody knew what was going on and um, there was a much more community feel anyway that's a, a different Auto story. Forwarding. Sorry? Auto forwarding. Auto forwarding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we have that now. Um, but it does often stagger me when I think just, you know, who could have imagined that we're at this point 10 years ago? You know, if you think about what we're, where we've come, and it's not just about 10 years, it's about 20 or 30 or 50 years, and the rate of change is extraordinary. And before I get to that, I'll just mention, I'm going to play a few clips from an address at, from the Singularity U conference last year in Christchurch. And I don't, was anybody there? Anybody here at the Singularity U? Um, if you ever get an opportunity to go, it'll be held again in New Zealand I'm sure at some point, you really should make every effort you can to go because the message from the Singularity U is about exponential change. And exponential change in a whole lot of disciplines and a whole lot of areas so they cover things like transport and energy and finance and you know there's a whole lot of areas and the point about exponential change is that really at this point you cannot predict what it's going to be like in a few years time because most predictions are based on linear change and when you look back in many respects what has happened over the last few years is exponential and so most predictions are wildly out because we're looking at exponential change. So my next point then is to come to a couple of messages that have come through recently in the media, one being the singularity U, but the other being just recently we had, we have a, um, a staff member at AUT, Professor Welby Ings, and some of you will have perhaps been aware of Welby's release of a book that he's written called Disruptive Teaching. Now, Welby is well known around this university for being um, a bit of a renegade. He believes, for example, that we should not assess students because assessing students simply means all they do is meet the standard. They don't let their creativity flow. And all that students learn to do through the years at school is what do I need to do to pass? And that's what we model all of our assessment on and that's what we constrain our students by. So I've got a couple of clips of the, um, you know, I hope this is still lined up properly. Um, I'm not sure which um, browser I'm going to at the moment. No. Sorry, I think I've got this lined up somewhere. to find it again, sorry, and the purpose of having it lined up was that I wanted to skip the ad that it cuts in at the beginning. So, um, oh, here we go, here we go, uh, no that's not right. Right. I thought I had this lined up and I think you're going to have to bother. As one of New Zealand's largest travel companies, that by the 15 seconds at the beginning that I can't. Ranging in size from small to medium. All right, we can, we can cut that down until it's finished. Um, oh, hang on, we haven't got that um, up on the screen, I'm sorry. Um, all right, I'm going to have to quit out of that, aren't I? Okay, there we go. I just want to know, 
10 minutes away from 8 o'clock. AUT Professor Welby Ings has always been a bit of a rebel, expelled from school and later suspended from college. It is no surprise uh, that he has written a book about disobedience, but his book, Disobedient Teaching, is about turning the negative into a positive, and I love this stuff. It's about how to use the rebel inside of us to challenge norms and change the world and perhaps change the way we're being taught. Professor Ings joins us now. Uh, well, we're nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Uh, Disobedient Teaching, the name of your book, what does it mean? It means that if we want to get innovation, <clears throat> if we want to get creativity or touch the heart of somebody, you have to go beyond formula. So as schools become preoccupied with assessment, become preoccupied with ritual and, and um, structuring things, there are those teachers who still continue to touch the heart of kids. And they disobey, but they disobey productively. They're strong enough to look into the face of convention and go, my professional radar tells me this is not right. And they've got the guts to disobey. But there's not enough. Okay, so that's the first little clip that I wanted to play of Welby. There are two different um, sources of um, his interviews. So the other part of the interview I took was from Radio New Zealand, from the national program where he, he was interviewed. So um, again, I'll just play the clip out of this, which is just radio, so there's no visual. Sorry about the YouTube generation. No video. Over um, how things happen. What do you see as the consequences of, of either over measuring and or over assessment? Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, so, so you imagine that you, you went into a system that where you found the way to survive was to actually work out what the formula was, what the agenda was, and then you were rewarded for producing stuff, demonstrating learning by conforming to those exemplars, conforming to those standards, conforming to those descriptors. What happens is that you become risk averse. You're not going to take risks because it will f it, you're not going to be rewarded for that. So the real danger, the really deep danger for us as a nation is that we end up with an education system that only pays lip service to innovation and what it does is it teaches strategy. And they're, they're two different things. We, we're a wee country at the bottom of the Pacific. And we have this idea of some myth about ourselves that we are um, we're naturally innovative. You don't get a naturally innovative country unless you design an education system that allows people to take risks and fail, allows people the, the full diversity of educational profiles, allows the, understands the fact that people learn in very different ways at different paces and just because your child is not writing their name when they're five does not mean that there's any terrible problem there. It's just that they learn in a different way. So if you, if you, reward, if you reward this um, and become preoccupied with rewarding people for measuring against standards and you place the standards at the centre, you will lose innovation and you lose the critical disobedience that we use to move ourselves forward. And Ted? So that's, uh, uh, sorry, then I just have another little bit of the, uh, the video shot. Um, but I think you get the idea of what I'm trying to get Welby to say. Let me just get the next bit. Because there's another piece I want him to say. Okay. Absolutely. And you need an education system that makes it okay that your authentic difference functions as a positive, so it's not something to be massaged away. So if you, if you, you can end up with this kind of marshmallow environment where everyone's trying to be safe. Learning's not safe, knowledge isn't safe, kids aren't safe, the world's not safe. You need authentic in there, but to do that, you've got to give it space to breathe. This is brilliant. This is a brilliant discussion. I wish we could carry this on. Is it just carrying on? No, we've got to move on. And this is the thing. Let's be disobedient. Break the rules. Let's be disobedient. Let's ask him the question. Uh, and I want to be really honest about this. Is our current education system failing New Zealand kids? Yes, and the reason it's failing, despite the fact that it looks very good on the rubrics, the reason it's failing is that we have to survive as an extremely innovative country. You don't grow innovation if you clamp down the way you reward things. 
So you, if you're going to get innovation, and we're, we're a little country in the bottom of the Pacific, unless we innovate, unless that... Sorry. How we survive in the world. We're in major problems. And so you don't rush out and look to see how somebody else has done it. You look into the nature of what your country is. You look into the nature of what learners are in this country, and you design from the ground up. And that kind of design, because New Zealand is by nature quite an innovative people, quite disobedient, the basic idea is they'll look, they'll get into a cold sack and they'll go, oh, bugger, okay, uh, and they'll look around for a while. You, 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 I really appreciate coming to the program today. That's brilliant. You should be promoted and rewarded, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so, so well-being, as, as we know at AUT, has a very, um, a, a very disruptive view of the way our education system should be travelling. Um, I, I believe quite a bit of what he's talking about is referring probably back to our compulsory school sector, probably our secondary school sector, but he says it really exactly the same thing about our tertiary sector. Um, that, and I know that a lot of lecturers will run a mile, a lot of our staff anyway will run a mile if they're challenged by this, but the idea that we should not be assessing students, we should not be putting boundaries around what they should do we should simply allow them to um, open out and be creative. I guess some of the views will be that that is discipline specific. Um, I'm not sure I want a, you know, a doctor operating on me who actually thinks they might experiment with something. In fact, that was one of the comments from the, um, the pebble pad, wasn't it, yesterday about somebody who's a radiology student or, or radiologist thinking, I might just experiment with these knobs a little bit while I've got you under the machine. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we need some boundaries. Okay, so Welby says that, and I think the important um, um, message from there is that we, we do have to think about the changing nature of our students. We do have to think about getting the best out of our students, and sometimes getting the best means giving them some, you know, some freedom, giving them some space. Anybody want to comment on, on Welby's points there? Yeah. No, no, I was just going to say, it, it, it's really, it's my kind of policy, it's this idea that, that we measure the things that are easy to measure mm. and, and, and get by some undue importance to it, and then disregard those things that we can't measure very easily and some of them do not become more. Yep. Yep. And that, that trend towards assessment and testing and testing and this. And I think Robbie's point is not the, the often um, uh, repeated point that we over-assess our students. I think it's about, in a way, that the way in which we assess them. I think it's both, actually. You were going to say... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think for me, key is what are you actually trying to get your students? What are your learning outcomes? What are your graduate attributes that you're trying to achieve? Um, can you achieve those by setting a three hour exam? And I think also, um, so many people actually coming out of the university with a degree, there needs to be a differentiating point between the different credentials. Are they really work ready as opposed to teachers? Yeah. Yep, sure. And, and the point I was going to make too, which I think has necessarily coming out of Welby's um, address there, but certainly an address he did at AUT uh, end of last year, is that as staff members we do the same thing. We know what it is that's going to get us promoted. We know what it is that's going to get us, you know, tenure or whatever. whatever. We need to tick these boxes. So we play the game. It is a game. We, we, un we get to know what the rules are and how that game is played and then we play the game. And um, in many cases, and I'm probably being rather overstating the case, but I suspect in many cases those lecturers that don't play the game, that actually do become disobedient teachers, they'll never get anywhere because the university doesn't understand how to value that and how to, you know, how to register um, value and promote that. Okay. Yeah. of the way the sort of political, you know, the neoliberal environment forced us. Because if you, if I think about him and, and, and his work where he comes from, we were teaching like that. We had that freedom to teach like that in the under 60s and 70s. Um, and there are great philosophical, he's drawing on a very long line of philosophical um, approach 
approaches around this way of being with people. It's not new stuff. That's a really good point. Yeah. And actually it does remind me, and I know this is probably starting to get a bit anecdotal, but when I first went to university, it was a long, long time ago, and I can remember times where we would actually skip lectures, we'd go take a bottle of wine or a case of beer and we'd go sit in Albert Park and we'd get royally pissed for the afternoon and we'd talk about all kinds of stuff. And actually uh, it, I can remember at one point our lecturer came in and joined us, you know, and we sat in Albert Park and we had a good old, you know, philosophical rant. I then, for my sins, took a few years out um, and came back, and then came back to finish degrees. It had totally changed. Everybody was so serious. And everybody kind of, you know, you wouldn't sit in the coffee bar and, and have. Everybody was in the library, and it was almost like there'd been a switch in the kind of, I don't know, the, the accreditation. It was all become a job market. Um, and I know that probably sounds a little bit sort of nostalgic and so on, but. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. That, that you know, there, there are there are um, you know subtle changes that go on in the marketplace for our graduates. Okay, thank you for that. Now the next, oh, sorry, that's what I want to do. The next slide now calls on the <coughs> the address that I referred to earlier from Singularity U. Now, Singularity U went over. Two full days, with or two and a half days actually, with addresses from some international speakers and some local speakers, some New Zealand speakers. And if you search on YouTube for Singularity U, you will find the video of presentations of the New Zealand speakers. For some reason, the international speakers I think are a bit more protected or something, um, and so those recordings don't get shown. But if you're interested in the kind of approach that's done here, search on YouTube for Singularity U. So the, I'm going to take a few clips out of the address by Sue Suckling. Now, some of you will know Sue or know of Sue. She's currently the chair of the board of NZQA. And I thought it was particularly pertinent to, pull, to, to present to you some of the thinking that's going on by her. I'm not saying this is, represents the whole of the board of NZQA. Um, but I think it is really important to understand that currently the chair of the board of NZQA is thinking like this. So I hope this comes through okay. Now the one oh. is that going to buffer? Hmm? Oh sorry. Okay, that'll be why. Won't be why actually, but Sorry. Uh, why is that guy just buffering on the web? Why is it not lost its wireless? Don't tell me. This is not going to help. Where's our IT man when I need him? Let me try relaunching that. Um, it doesn't have a full internet. Um, you can get here. Now, one of the I think. All right. Okay. Let's. Um, all right. Is that this one or the other one? Is that USB? Yeah, it's USB. The only wee thing we have to find is with it, because AUT for their bless them. Um, only certain devices able to use that network in certain areas. Thank you. 
Ya. Paraphrase, so let me try one more time. Yeah, 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 but it wouldn't pick up the um, the Ethernet. <laughs> the work isn't it, you know, shit happens. Sorry, <laughs> um, <laughs> I tried this. A couple of days ago down here and wireless, no problem. Yeah, I'll try the conference Wi Fi. It's Mahara 27. <coughs> It's not buffering. Oh well, it is. I to get a better outcome, and I just gave two right. examples here in New Zealand, and one is the Niagara Kaladi Trust, which a number of you will know about, and done a sensational job. And the other is the various Molly where I need to start it, Molly Trust that are okay. now saying we're not waiting anymore. We're going to put money in to, to enable our kids to participate in education in a different way. And I'll give you an example of that shortly. Now, the, one of the I think most powerful things driving the need for system change is digitisation, as was talked about yesterday transfers power from governments down to the individual. So this young woman with her robot may be nowhere near any educational institute. She could have worked out how to build that by watching YouTube and buying some things off eBay. She could have been learned to do it in a makerspace. You wouldn't get any credits from NZQA if you went and did it at the makerspace. She could have done it in a hackathon. She could have done it in a competition. There's so many places she could have done this and she could have done it whenever she wanted, wherever she wanted. So the power that is transforming, transferring to the individual is demanding, we think, about what our education system structure is. So I think that's where I probably stopped that clip. Um, so remember this is the chair of NZQA saying these things. So the next clip, let's see if that comes out okay. And it's alright, I was told by Lisa and she had not show all five of these, so you're safe. So last year the World Economic Forum did some work on, well, what are the 21st century skills? I think you can nearly read that, but what you, what, if you can't, I'll tell you what it doesn't say. It doesn't say expertise in subject matter is a key 21st century skill. It says we all need some foundation literacies. Liter and, and those can be um, literacy, numeracy, scientific literacy. So we need some of those. It also says we need to develop competencies. 
and those need to be things like creativity and collaboration. And it also says what will serve you well in this world ahead are character qualities. Dan's wonderful character quality of 14 years, of grit and determination, of Armin's um, uh, AQ, adaptability quotient. Those are the things that we need for, our, for the future. And perhaps lastly, future going forward, our New Zealand system future, it's got to be built around learner centric. It's got to embrace self-directed, self-constructed learning. It's got to embrace and value global participation and not be New Zealand centric. And it's got to look at, if we can access that and access that really well, we'll get there faster. It's got to include how do we actually impart 21st century skills and if we have to assess them, how would we assess that in a meaningful way that will help the individual go forward? So essentially what Sue Suckling is saying is she kind of agrees with Welby in, in one sense because what, <clears throat> what is coming through from there really is the fact that <coughs> Excuse me. Um, NZQA is kind of, you know, 19th century approach to student um, progress. And at one point, she actually says, as part of that address, uh, something along the lines of um, regulators are the handbrake of society. And of course, NZQA is one of the key regulators that we have in our New Zealand education system. Now, it's going to take a lot to get to the kind of um, idealistic state that both Welby and Sue espouse, um, but I think it's really, you know, it's really interesting to see that kind of message coming from the chair of NZQA, because they are the ones that set the, the framework for New Zealand qualifications. The, uh, but as I say, I, I encourage you to find that that uh, address on YouTube and and watch it, and there are other interesting ones as well. Now, perhaps lastly, as an indication of the changing nature of education, um, I found these two quotes out of the Horizon Report, and I was particularly looking for anything that related to e-portfolios for this address, so the New Media Consortium, most of you will know about the Horizon Report. Um, the 27, sorry, 2017 version says, and I'll just read quickly through these, as more institutions adopt mastery and competency-based education approaches, learning ecosystems must support the process of skill acquisition and assessment. To carry out their competency-driven mission, Grand Canyon University uses Loud Cloud, a tool that leverages a host of open educational resources and learning analytics to personalise learning experiences. And then as a second um, sample or scenario, Western Governors University, widely acknowledged leader in delivering competency-based education online, does not have a learning management system. Instead, they've designed learning portals specifically for each course where students engage in projects and discussions, access free e-textbooks and build portfolios. So really, the point there, I think, is, you know, and I've been the manager of our learning management system for a million years, um, there are moves and directions that are kind of saying let's get rid of this monolithic infrastructure, let's start to open it out and have um, pl almost plug-in um, activities for students. So just coming back to I think hopefully the point about this all <coughs> is about where is our education system going and I've got a few um, sort of my mantras I suppose about learning design and the evolution of um, delivery and assessment and for me it comes in this order that you first of all need to know what your learning outcomes are, you need to know what your graduate attributes are, what are you trying to achieve in this paper, in this course, in this degree. Secondly you need to know how are you going to know that students have reached those learning outcomes. So how do you know you've delivered on what you said you would do? That's your form of assessment. How can you tell? And then to lead up towards that 
that form of assessment, what is it that the learning activities are going to be. And I think too often we take a technology and we design learning activities around the technology or around a, a particular approach without really having that alignment pro properly set up. So there's no point in doing it. People used to say in the early days of learning management systems, I put up a discussion board but nobody contributed. Well, what was the purpose of the discussion board? Oh, I just thought it would be cool to do it. Well, of course they didn't contribute because it had no purpose, it had no meaning. So the idea of having some alignment I think is, is critical. Um, the next thing for me is, and I've often you know, ranted on about this and beaten on about this. It's an old, well, 2000 um, paper, this one. Jan Harrington, Ron Oliver um, and Tom Reeves did a lot of work on the idea of authentic assessment. And, um, you know, I like the idea that assessment has some authentic value. It's not just a moment in time. It's actually a, a, an opportunity to learn as an activity in itself. So whether it's project-based or scenario-based, teamwork, whatever, um, and there are some you know, critical aspects to what I believe constitutes um, an authentic piece of assessment. Again, the way that this is applied will be probably very discipline-specific. Discipline um, some areas will lend themselves to this better than others. <coughs> so, I guess coming towards the end of this, where does Mahara fit in this picture? Mahara is what we're all here about. Um, I actually do believe that Mahara is um, a product that does lend itself to a lot of these challenges, that um, you allow students their own space. Mahara, the really original concept of Mahara was that it was a student-owned piece of work. And I actually think there are some tensions in Mahara more recently because it's now become an assessment tool and originally it was never intended for that. Originally it was, was student work and then institutions try and wrap around some constraints about assessment. You know, how do I get the student to submit it? How do I know that it's their work? How, how can I pass turn it in, uh, Mahara through turn it in? Well, please don't. Um, I, I put through a, a little list of the, some of the things that I think we'd still like to see developed in Mahara and I'm probably a little out of date and I've talked to Shen and Lisa a bit, you know, are these still relevant points because as I've said it's probably a year or so since I, almost a year since I moved into the director role and so I have a lot less contact now with a lot of these tools. Um, we'd, we'd like to see um, some of the collaboration tools, I mean yes you can set up groups of friends and so on, um, can we really do properly collaborative group portfolios? Maybe we can. Maybe I'm out of date on that. Um, I would like, we've got Blackboard here at AUT, there's a number of different, I know that Mahara integrates better with Moodle than Blackboard, but we would really like to see some work done on that. Um, assessment, again I've just said it shouldn't be an assessment tool and yet it is. Um, our lecturers often come back and say there's not enough ways to, you know, to give feedback or to match against an assessment rubric or whatever. Um, and I do believe we need better mobile support. Um, you know, our students all have small devices, smartphones, um, whatever, that we need to have better um, connection to the portfolio. <coughs> so over the next two days, I know you're going to have lots of presentations, you're going to see lots of really interesting ideas. Um, I haven't tried to go through and highlight those. Katrina, you kind of set the scene a little bit, which was great, some of the things on the program. Um, and it will be really good to see a range of institutions, a range of um, sectors presenting and the work that's being done. So I really do wish you well over the next two days. I think it's going to be interesting. Um, and basically that's it. And as I said to Shen and Lisa, I took it right to the last slide before I had to bore anybody with my grandchildren. <laughs> So, any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Anybody want to sort of raise some discussion? We've probably got, what have we got, 10 minutes before between you and cup of tea? Yeah, I think, um, Mark, the one of, I guess one of the problems we've got that somebody spoke about earlier is we've got this direction of personalising learning and making it more um, <coughs> tailored to the learner and all this kind of stuff. And then going in the opposite, complete opposite direction, we've got the requirement for 
increased staff-student ratios, uh, massification of classes, so you're not, if you have a class less than X, it will not run because it's not sustainable, unquote. Yep. Um, and, and a real, um, I think, um, just competing pedagogical directions. And my fear is that the people that are way above my pay grade actually are more in, in tune with the massification side of things mm. than they are with the personalisation side of things. Um, how do we get people who are advocates for sort of different pedagogies somewhere in the kind of decision making echelon? You expect me to have an answer? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this is part of what being a keynote speaker is. <laughs> no, I mean, all I can say, Stephen, I totally agree. And, yeah. and of course, we've got those, those competing tensions. I mean, you know, in our case, a university, in your case, a university, in many cases, other kinds of institutions or PTs or whatever, we are businesses. We need to, you know, run within a budget. We need to run at a profit. We need to try and keep our costs down for students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, we have exactly the same tensions about student numbers and about profitability and about costs and so on. I mean, you know, I'm under a pump at the moment for budget. Um, yeah, all I can say is, yep, I agree. <laughs> and and I think, but I think there are I think there are key people who are at those levels of responsibility who do get the, the, the need to do something transformative. Um, and I certainly won't single out any institutions because I probably don't know in particular. But I know I've been to conferences and had addresses by you know, vice chancellors or pro-vice chancellors who, in my view, actually are really you know, doing some great stuff. Um, I don't think it's widespread. I think we do have a lot of still, you know, business management going on at the top rather than education transformation or um, 21st century education. Um, to me, this is often a kind of a spiral journey. And you go, you're trying to get there, but you have to go there. You know, so it's a small bit at a time, small changes at a time. And I actually think even... In, in pedagogical sense, even in, our in, even in our teaching strategies. If you think back to the way we were maybe 20 or 30 years ago, we have evolved, we have changed. We don't change as fast as we'd like, and maybe as, sorry, as you said before, maybe we've changed in the wrong direction in some regards, um, but we're not a static industry. And so sometimes I think, you know, looking back over time, you think, oh, well, actually, most of our lecturers are now doing things differently to the way they work. Although saying that, we just had a big um, hoo-ha uh, at the beginning of the year when a new building went up out in the South Campus and we had huge complaints because there were not whiteboards. And I can't possibly teach without a whiteboard. And we're saying, but you, students at the back of that lecture theatre can't see the whiteboard. So you've got, a, you've got an interactive tablet there. You do, you, that's, oh, no, 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 I couldn't possibly do without a whiteboard. Um, and so, you know, there are people, there are lots of challenges still that we're facing. So, yeah. How are you navigating, in, in particular in the in Steve Flights, the, the tension between the personal learning environment and still needing to provide assessment as well? Before you the, the, the difficulty I have with the sort of the point that Welby has is that I personally still think that we have to, we're in the business of providing graduates. Now how you define a graduate in most people's measure is some way of saying you have met the requirements to be somebody that we as an institution will put out into the market as one of our graduates. So there has to be some kind of standard I guess, some kind of standard that you measure a student against. Now how you define that as assessment I think depends very much on the discipline. Um, I mean, if we, we've got a very large health sector, health services school, um, nursing and a lot of the other health practices, they have their own accreditation boards. You know, somebody has to, to register with the nursing council or the podiatry association or whatever it is. Um, we can't send out graduates that have had no measures of control. 
or no measures of, you know, of meeting standards. So um, I think that uh, um, it's a sort of a box we bang up against all the time. You know, some disciplines will have doors that open and allow you to go out. I was talking to somebody from our Bachelor of Creative Technologies just the other day. They have, I think, one lecture a week. The rest of the time it's totally self-directed work. But creative technologies kind of lends itself to that, you know. If you've got language class or, um, you know, perhaps engineering or something like that, completely different demands. And so I think we do have to be aware of the discipline the context um, and, and work with that differently. I mean, we, we have a centre where we have half a dozen academic advisors and each of those will have you know, specific expertise in certain discipline areas and, and, and an understanding of what the needs are. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just an ongoing journey, I think, of understanding what people need and what students need. Are we done? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>